I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small. Encounters that move us beyond words. One used to think, oh, that's dirt. And then we started thinking, no, that's soil, and it's actually alive. And now I think, that's not just soil, right? That's human soil. That's the dust of people over 23,000 years that are here and they're present in this land. This is, I think, why Native people feel such an obligation to their lands. It's not just that, like, oh, there's a few generations of ancestors buried there. It's that there are tens of thousands of years of ancestors who've literally become the stuff of the land. Literally? Ancestors who have morphed into land? Well, we shouldn't forget this notion from ancient Hebrews, a hemisphere away, who left a story about humankind originating from soil and returning to soil. In the sweat of your face, God tells the first human couple, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. In fact, the very name Adam means red earth. Our guest today, Philip Deloria, can speak with considerable authority about the reverence held by Native Americans for literal ancestral land. He'll be sharing with us his sense for the power of place. His ideas on the subject derive not only from scholarly analysis, he's a well-known historian at Harvard, but also from the Lakota legacy that has devolved upon him from his own family tree, a tree deeply rooted in the soil that is family. I've tipped my hand about where this episode will end. Awe and wonder can infuse our experience of place because of the people who once inhabited it. I want to share with you a compelling and nearly improbable story about a family woven together from so many diverse threads that the word colorful hardly suffices, the Deloria family. Let's acquaint ourselves with some of these threads, or to be more literal, with the soil of Philip Deloria's past. The year is 1831. A young man in modern South Dakota is out on what we now might call a personal retreat It's not a vacation. Sasue is his name. He is himself of mixed blood, a descendant of French fur traders and the Yankton Lakota people. It was a very common mix in this era. Sasue is looking for a vision to guide him forward in life. It's a Lakota tradition to seek such spiritual illumination on the threshold of adulthood, a pivotal rite echoed in many cultures. Sasue is going out seeking a vision, and the whole story of the vision is really quite interesting. He digs a pit. Sometimes people would just stand and pray, but he digs a pit, and he he sort of puts his head down, and he waits for an animal or a spirit to call him, and one does. There's a hawk and an owl involved. They lead him into a lodge, a teepee. On one side, he sees four skeletons with their bones tied together with grass. On the other side, he sees four sweat lodges and the skeletons sort of taunt him. Uh, And these two birds are sitting at the far end of the lodge of the teepee, and they say, you got to choose a path. And so he chooses the path of the sweat lodge. And when he comes down off this hill after having the vision, and he meets with these the old men who would interpret it for him, they say, oh, you've just made a decision that you're going to kill four of us, and you'll need these four sweat lodges for purification. If you had chosen the other way, you would have killed four of our enemies. That's why they were taunting you. So he was a feared man because people knew that he'd had this vision where he would kill some of his own people. That is, of course, once again the voice of Philip Deloria. As a professor, he specializes in the culture and histories of indigenous peoples and the contradictions that made America. The flute is played by Calvin Standing Bear. He's a full-blooded Lakota, I mentioned Sasue's mixed French and Indian blood. Sasue is short for Francois. His full European name is Francois de Laurier. And it's no coincidence that our guest's name is Philip Deloria. Sasue is Philip Deloria's great great grandfather. You could say that in his very person, this modern descendant physically embodies the kind of history he writes about and teaches. 
Sasue was just the ways that Dakota people were pronouncing Francois de Loyer. And I wish I was a better French speaker, but you can hear the ways in which the sound of the thing is very much similar. And in fact, if you trace through colonial France, there's a lot of de Lauriers. Upstate New York, sort of St. Louis area, New Orleans area, there's de Lauriers all over the place. There's a census in 1785 from Fort Vincennes, Indiana, and there's a Francois de Laurier there. And my dad always thought that that person had made his way up the Missouri River, intermarried with the Yankton, Ihontoan people on the Missouri River. But my friend Ray DeMalle, a fabulous anthropologist of the Northern Plains, thought that there was an equally important case that the de Lauriers may have come up from New Orleans. <laughs> so who knows? Our the entire family is sort of a mixed blood family from the very, very beginning. And I will say, my great grandfather, they said that, in, you know, he died in 1931, that he actually spoke English with a French accent. We left Sasue just starting to grapple with the implications of this vision or dream with the animals and the skeletons and the sweat lodges. The confusing and rather foreboding contours of that 1831 vision would not come into sharper focus until much later in his life. The generation just after his would emerge and grow into adulthood, by which time Sasue would have risen to become a respected teacher, a leader among his own people, often described as a medicine man. And over all those years, he would never forget the strange vision and would struggle to understand what it might indicate about his path in life. Calvin Standing Bear once again singing the Four Directions song. That's a title that just seemed appropriate for this moment in the story of Sasue's young life. Sasue's own son, Philip J. Deloria, after whom our guest was named, is just 10 years old. 1863 comes, and a key part of Sasue's dream is about to be fulfilled. The American Civil War is raging in the East and South. Out west in Dakota country, there's bloodshed as well. Just beyond the encampment of Sasue's people is a troop of U.S. soldiers. They are led by Colonel Alfred Sully. Sully is gaining a reputation as a ruthless Indian fighter on the frontier, and his orders are to exact punishment on Indian warriors who a year earlier had killed hundreds of white settlers in Minnesota. Those hostilities are a few months behind, and the Lakota communities along the Missouri are now sheltering some of those offending warriors, never mind that the 1862 uprising in Minnesota had been sparked by treaty violations on the part of the United States. The U.S. Army is about to be uncompromising in meeting out revenge. On September 3, 1863, at Whitestone Hill, Dakota Territory, Colonel Alfred Sully leads an attack on a teepee village. The soldiers kill hundreds of warriors and also women and children indiscriminately. More attacks on the Lakota people seem imminent. Alfred Sully basically engages in an ethnic cleansing campaign in the Dakotas, and he's chasing people around, and he comes into this Yankton camp, and he says, I know you've got some of these refugee Indians from Minnesota here, and what are you going to do about it? And Sasway says, okay, I've had a vision where I kill one of our own. I will, I will kill a person, one of these people, and I will present him to Alfred Sully. So he does that, and then he tells Alfred Sully, okay, we've taken care of this now, so you leave here, right? You leave our camp. So Sully and Sasue are actually in a conflictual moment, and this killing ends up having this kind of healing consequence in that there's not going to be a fight, there's not going to be a battle, many, many more people are not going to die here, you know, and so Sasue and Sully are engaged in this curious dance. In essence, Sasue carries out a death sentence that was sought by the U.S. military, and by doing it with his own hand, he halts a blood feud between indigenous peoples and the U.S. military with a ladder represented by Alfred Sully. This curious dance, as Deloria calls it, between Sasue and Sully is not yet quite over. In fact, the dance will never end. The fates of these two men, if not their feet, are about to get forever tangled in an improbable subsequent alliance between these two rivals. Five years earlier, Alfred Sully had already been stationed in Dakota Territory, and there he had pursued a relationship with a young Indian woman, 18 years his junior. 
Her name was Pehandutawin, or Red Crane Woman. In 1858, their daughter was born, a girl named Mary Sully. Though she barely knew her father Alfred, Mary Sully would keep his name. For his part, after the Civil War, Alfred Sully would leave the frontier, move east, and marry a white woman. Now, this is going to be a nearly unimaginable circle to square, but we'll let Sussway's great-great-grandson, Philip Deloria, explain what happened. It's about the tying or tangling, maybe I should actually say the untangling of an incredible knot in his family. Well, the expression I'm going for here actually is tying the knot. Sully's daughter, Mary Sully, who grew up the Yankton people, Sasue's son, Tipi Sapa, Black Lodge, also known as Philip J. Deloria, will also grow up there. So they, they know each other, right, as they're growing up. They'll each marry other people, and then they will become widower and, and widow, um, and then they will come back together. In other words, marry. On various occasions, uh, Philip Deloria, I have heard you describe your family as as weird, the, the diplomat in me would say unusual, but it's your family after all. So when you use an adjective like that, weird, how do, how do you mean it exactly? Is it just the improbability of so many disparate threads coming together in your family that they, they all get interwoven? Yeah, and when I say weird and crazy, I don't necessarily mean that each one of these folks was weird themselves or crazy themselves, but that like it is an odd, as you say, an improbable set of circumstances that brings these people together. For me, there's just a mystery to it, right? My dad spent a lot of time writing about Carl Jung and talking about the idea of synchronicity, right? Something that is not analytically sound, but is more than a coincidence. It's something that's mysterious that we can't quite explain. It's improbabilities or something to be celebrated and not swept under the rug, right? Embraced and engaged. And I think this is in some ways how Susie would have seen herself relative to, say, Thomas Sully or Alfred Sully. Susie and Thomas, where do they fit in? Well, the Sully branch of the family tree goes like this. Thomas is father of Colonel Alfred, who you will recall in his relationship with Red Crane Woman becomes father to Mary, who as a widow marries Sasway's son Philip to become mother of three Deloria siblings, including Susie. Again, the direct line of descent that concerns us most here is Thomas, Alfred, Mary, Susie. Some of these Sullys were also fine artists. Thomas Sully had painted Queen Victoria, and Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. Thomas Sully was a preeminent portrait artist who achieved access to high circles in European society and also among the American political elite. His boy Alfred was not only a military man, but also aspired to the aesthetic life like his father, the portrait painter. With an artist's brush in one hand and a revolver in the other, Alfred seems like a psychological contradiction. You know, he's like all historical figures. He's a complicated historical figure, but his actions have had devastating consequences for Native people in the Dakotas. It feels like how we choose, by the time we get back a couple of generations, we have many people to choose from in constructing a narrative of our own lives. And who you omit is oftentimes as important as who you choose. Does the Indian fighter Alfred Sully deserve all the opprobrium history can heap upon him and more? Does his officer's career in the U.S. military campaigns, does it sully the Sully reputation? Sorry, I could not resist that one. Well, however scurrilous Alfred's record on the frontier was, what did his posterity, his own flesh and blood, uh, what did they end up doing with his legacy? We'll have more about the Sully family and art ere long here on Constant Wonder, I'm Marcus Smith. Thanks for listening. My guest is Philip Deloria, a history professor at Harvard University. We're learning about his family's story of curiously intertwined roots. And speaking of Philip, let's check back with his namesake, the earlier Philip in the family, the son of Sasue. At the time of the 1862 and 1863 bloodshed between the Lakota and the U.S. military, this earlier Philip was still a lad of about 10. Well, as boys do, this one grew up, and the world around him changed dramatically. 
The wars fell behind. The Lakota were moved to reservations, his own people ultimately inhabiting the Standing Rock Reservation in South Dakota. And the U.S. government, in a move it would never consider today, gave the Episcopal Church a strong hand in shaping reservation life. As Philip grew to maturity, his father Saswe, who was still a very imposing figure, a respected elder in his own community, well, he urged his boy to make a radical departure from past ways in order to help his people. When the Christian church comes in, the Episcopal church, he tells his son, Philip J. Deloria, the person I'm named for, that he ought to embrace the church as a sort of way of kind of taking a leadership role with his people. And then eventually, the end of this story is that Saswe is baptized in the church. Um, and when he does, the thing that had been haunting him, the spirits of these four people, every time he took a drink of coffee or water, he would look down and he would see the faces of the men he had killed. Um, and so as he told it, and as the church liked to tell it, when he converted, uh, you know, that the faces of these men disappeared, that he, his sins were wiped clean, as the church folk would, would say. That nudge by Saswe to his son Philip to join the ministry, so says Deloria family tradition, well, that was a first step in addressing whatever it was that his 1831 vision meant. The path Saswe chose in that dream, the path of the sweat lodge or path of purification, would require expiation for the blood he had shed. And this expiation, again, by longstanding family tradition, would require their collective service to Saswe's people, ongoing, multi-generational efforts to set things right. Deloria family descendants of the 20th century came to see their religious and eventually their scholarly activities as well as fulfillment of this obligation. But at what point would the job be done? Well, it's, it's, this is something my dad always said, was that this is kind of where this vision started. And when I went to grad school, my dad said, for seven generations, our family's committed to doing this kind of work, moving back and forth between these cultures and trying to advocate for Native people while also sort of smoothing the path into a future. After I finished grad school, he said, oh, it was just four generations. It wasn't, it wasn't seven at all. <laughs> so he was in some ways sort of telling me I didn't belong, but also letting me off the hook of these obligations. But I have always felt this, this kind of obligation. And maybe that is a cultural thing that he just handed to me. But maybe it's also a spiritual thing that has larger and deeper kinds of consequence. For Philip, the son of Saswe, Philip J. Deloria, uh, one of the early benefits of having taken up the Christian cross was that this enabled him to gain access for his own people to quality educational opportunities. Of course, this came in tow with substantial acculturation to the ways of whites. Uh, but these changes, to some degree, were not a complete rejection, not, not an abnegation of their past. The family and the community on the reservation still honored Lakota tradition while also trying to build bridges to the wider world. And that meant schooling, too. Then the schooling I'm talking about here applied to three of the Deloria children that Philip had by his second wife, Mary Sully. Their names were Ella, Susie, and Vine. He's one of the first Lakota people to be ordained in the church. And he is in charge of the Standing Rock Reservation. And he has a church called St. Elizabeth's in Wakapala, South Dakota. The Episcopal school that is there taught by a woman named Mary Sharp Francis, who is one of these kind of characters, small, tough, missionary, teaching women, but who is very, very concerned about her charges and has musical instruments and brings plants into the classroom. And this is not quite like the boarding school story that we oftentimes hear, right, of sort of brutalization and beatings and linguistic suppression, suppression of language. He gives his sermons in the Lakota language. They have a Lakota language hymnal. They've got a Lakota language Bible that's been translated. 
Philip's daughter, Ella, benefits greatly from this rich learning environment. It's an unusual haven of opportunity, very rare, actually, for the time and place that she was in. Uh, she's able to crash through social barriers that stand in her way as a young woman and also as a Native American living on a reservation. So Ella comes out of the St. Elizabeth School and goes to the All Saints School, which is kind of the colonial school for government officials and high mucky mucks in the church. And so it's for their kids. And she goes there and she gets quite a good education. So she knows Latin and she does all kinds of things. And from there, she goes to Oberlin, progressive liberal arts college. And from there, she actually goes and graduates from the teacher's college at Columbia University. So it's quite an extraordinary story of Ella's education. Ella Deloria's professional trajectory was really something. She became a prominent anthropologist, a linguist, a writer, and a chronicler of Lakota traditions and history. Her sister Susie, by comparison, struggled, even with many of the very same educational advantages. It seems that Susie may have suffered from what today we would call an anxiety disorder. Yeah, it takes a while for this to sort of emerge. So everyone in the family says, well, she's very shy. She's chronically shy. And then the shyness starts to become a more pressing matter. Well, she's so shy, she's reluctant to leave her room. While they're in Kansas, she actually spends a short period of time in a kind of institution. It's a sort of mental hygiene kind of place. And some of the doctors that she's seeing are actually really at the forefront of mental hygiene kinds of practices in the early 20th century. But she finds a way to kind of thread the needle between saying like, yeah, I actually don't belong in an institution, but I actually don't work very well in the world. If you don't function very well in the larger world, out and about in society, well, just where do you go? Many a quiet soul, like Susie Deloria, has found refuge and fulfillment and purpose pursuing art that is reclusive or private. And this is how she channeled her energy. For the most part, Susie was self-taught, and here's what she very quietly produced. Over 130 drawings that are very colorful in their geometric patterns. They're more than just a little reminiscent of Native American decoration, the, the kinds of patterns we know from traditional crafts. But Susie called her drawings personality prints, even though they aren't exactly representational. They're mostly abstract, maybe symbolic, certainly expressive, we know that she had a great interest in modernism, so there's something of that in their abstraction. And she also leaned on her experience with those crafts of indigenous peoples like beadwork and quilling and painting. But back to this notion of hers, that they were personality prints. What did she mean by that? Apparently, most all of these pieces of art are actually intended to capture the essence or the nature or the personality of some specific person— I got a little more background on Susie's efforts as an artist from Philip Deloria, her great nephew. They're drawn on paper with colored pencil and occasionally black ink, sometimes white paint. You can see her develop these forms across time. I think it has everything to do with her sort of psychological challenges. It's a thing that allows her to claim an identity for herself. But I think claiming the identity as an artist is a kind of coping mechanism or strategy for her, as is the art itself. So if you're someone who really doesn't want to come out of your room, I've thought of her as kind of the Emily Dickinson of Indian visual arts, you know? That's so funny you would say that because just the other day I was describing her to my producer. I said, you got to think of this woman as kind of like an Emily Dickinson. Yeah, yeah. And over time, she becomes more and more reclusive as Emily Dickinson. If you're someone who just wants to not come down in the stairs and talk to people, but to stay in your room, you know, having this kind of artistic project is really one way to think about a, a literal coping strategy for your day-to-day -day life. You can go online anytime to see some of her personality prints. All you have to do is look up the name, listen carefully, Mary Sully, which Susie took as a pseudonym. More about that later. They kind of look like they could be quilt patterns. They look like they have Native American recurring themes or shapes. They're vibrant. They're patterned. But they're not just a Navajo rug, for instance. There's more going on there. The, these works, each one is a triptych. So it's got three panels, and actually it has a label, so it really technically has four pieces of paper um, there. The first panel is sort of representational or abstract. If you know who the person is, for example, there's one for Babe Ruth, 
There's one for J. Edgar Hoover. So each one of these is actually a named person. I, I don't want to say each one. Some of them are concepts. So she does one for spring. She does one for Easter. Uh, she does one for greed. Um, so there's certain things like that. There are church kinds of images as well, but most of them have a person's name attached to them. And, and yet almost exclusively abstract. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she's in the first panel, she's sort of towing the line between abstraction and representation. And, you know, a lot of times you look at the thing and it looks like a very abstract pattern. And then you discover a fact about the person's life and it becomes slightly representational. And then the second panel turns into a design pattern that you might find on a wallpaper or a, or a you know, fabric or something like that. And then the third panel, which is a slight, slightly smaller, is these oftentimes very complicated designs that draw upon Native American themes and icons and heritage, but oftentimes really transcend that. So they're complicated and, and especially reading the three panels together is, is oftentimes really quite challenging and, and quite fun. Are these the kinds of things that in her lifetime ever hung on gallery walls? They never did. They may have driven to Milwaukee one day and showed it to the Milwaukee Women's Club. But as far as I can tell, these are the only times when this actually hung on a wall. I want you to imagine Ella and Susie traveling to Milwaukee, to the women's club there, toting along a gray cardboard box. It's about 24 inches long, just about as wide. Her life's artistic output is contained inside that box. The box itself, housing the prints, would pass to Ella upon Susie's death, 1963, then to Vine Deloria Sr. upon Ella's death in 1971, to Vine Jr.'s wife three decades later, eventually to our guest, Philip Deloria. And they managed to survive all these decades. It's something of a miracle, because as they moved from hand to hand, nobody after Ella, not until Philip, really saw any particular significance in them. Susie never made money or gained any kind of fame from these objects, but that wasn't really their purpose at all now, was it? Today, I think they are as much a representation of her own identity, her own personal odyssey, as they are of, of Babe Ruth or anybody else. As I mentioned earlier, when Susie Deloria reached adulthood, she changed her name to match that of her mother, Mary Sully, the daughter of Alfred Sully. Why the pseudonym? Well, it's so complicated, but it's so interesting. You know, there's a tradition in Lakota culture, right, of the double woman, a person who is gifted with incredible artistic talent, not something you get from training, but something you get from above, from the spirits, right? And there were some whispers that her mother may have been a double woman, have, may have had this intense artistic kind of skill. So it descends to her from her Lakota side, but also from her grandfather, Alfred Sully. Who, if not a double man may have been duplicitous in his intentions with at least one Native woman. When this West Point grad who earned his reputation as an Indian fighter on the frontier wasn't too busy executing the U.S. military agenda by executing indigenous defenders and their families, Alfred Sully could often be found painting. He belonged to a handful of uniformed men who were known as military artists. These were men whose contributions now serve as uh, visual documentation, you could say, of any number of historic scenes across the continent. Today, from time to time, Alfred's watercolors and oil paintings can be found fetching a few thousand dollars at auction. At Sotheby's, for instance, I checked it out. Just three years ago, his oil depiction of a bison sold there in the category of important Americana. Couldn't find the price. But that same painting, The Bison, is currently available from a Raider Galleries listed at a cool 38000 What I'm saying is that Alfred remains a noted artist today, if not nearly as famous as his father, the portrait painter Thomas. This is all to explain that wherever Alfred went, from California to the Dakotas, he went with the eye of a visual artist, bringing his brushes, his pens, his pigments. His work exhibits a keen attention to detail. And this strikes me as almost anthropological on his part. He created at least three portraits of the Indian maiden Pehandutawin, or Red Crane Woman. You have to ask, was he painting his wife or just a conquest? We'll likely never know that. And this is the Lakota woman with whom he fathered Susie Deloria's mother, Mary. 
His famous father, Thomas, the portrait painter, well, that's very much worth time to go online and see the wide array of famous people who sat for him on both sides of the Atlantic. Queen Victoria said that Thomas Sully's portrait of her was her was one of her very favorites. The portrait of Andrew Jackson that is found on the $20 bill was painted by Thomas Sully. He was quite a well-known artist in the sort of antebellum period of American history. Susie is very interested in sort of making her personality prints of celebrities. And Thomas Sully, in some ways, is also painting the celebrities of his day, right, making these portraits. So there's an intergenerational thing. And these sisters thought about it and talked about it. They thought art, actually, and artistic skill would pass through generations and that Susie's work had something to do with her grandfather and great-grandfather and her mother and her, all the folks in her genealogy. Susie was, in fact, so thoroughly imbued with the spirit, I might want to say the genius, of the past artists in her family, she ultimately chose to become Mary Sully herself in the way she was doubling up on somebody who was already a double woman in Lakota tradition. And if, in fact, Susie thought of her drawings as personality prints, it's really not a leap at all to see that her genre was kind of a birthright from the past, or maybe a, a bridge to the past, continuity with the strands of her various family roots, all the way back to Alfred and Thomas, but also to her indigenous side. This is a theme that she and her sister Ella discussed at length. So says great-nephew Philip Deloria. Our attempt to kind of get inside her head and understand her motives, her hopes, her dreams, all of this would be impossible had it not been for the preservation of that box, that humble box which at multiple junctures along the way was very close to vanishing altogether. I'm Marcus Smith, and you're listening to Constant Wonder. We're speaking with Philip J. Deloria, professor of history at Harvard University. He's author of Playing Indian, and most recently author of the book Becoming Mary Sully, Toward an American Indian Abstract. Once again, the music here is from Calvin Standing Bear. We've talked about Alfred Sully's grandchildren, who were also Francois de Laurier or Sassoué's grandchildren, Ella and Susie, two very different sisters, one confident and outward-looking, the other coping with anxiety as a reclusive artist. We haven't touched yet on their brother, Vine Deloria, who as an Episcopal minister like his father Philip, turned out to be a gifted storyteller and a preacher and a community leader. You know, my grandfather always took time with us to sort of tell us stories. He loved to be tape recorded. There's a whole sort of dynamic around Native people and tape recorders, I think is really interesting. My grandfather epitomized that. So people are always sending me tapes, actually sort of tailed off lately, but tapes of my grandfather telling stories. So I did grow up hearing those things and, and knowing those things, but the music really kind of captured me at first, and it was along a circuitous path back around, right, to where I find myself now. We have a recording of Vine Deloria Sr. telling a story, our guest's grandfather. It's a story told to him by his father, the son of Sasue. And as you listen, I think you're going to understand why people were always recording him. The power of place comes through in this tale with reverence and connection to ancestral lands. Also going on here clearly is a grappling with the encroaching pressures of modernity. This is about a man named Redleaf. The way I heard the story was from my father in 1926. He retired and went back to the Yanktons and lived among his own community called the White Swan Community. See, named after one of the fighters, you see. And so we were driving back from Lake Andy South, and we're going to turn to go down to the Missouri River bottom. And you came to a sunrise hill, they said. Right there, he stopped, and he said, I want to tell you a story. And to our right, there was a nice, level piece of ground. We, the white swan people, were camped here. And... Among us was Redleaf. 
His wife died. His daughter died. His granddaughter died. And so his great-granddaughter was taking care of him. He was 99 years old. His hair was hardly, hardly gray. Tall and very slender. And he lived in a little teepee next to his granddaughter. And one day he called her in and said, Tonight at midnight, I'm going to leave for the other world. He wasn't sick. And so this evening, I want you to prepare and describe a certain meal, and I want to have a good meal. And then I want to sing my songs, and then I will leave. So she said, all right, I will send two of my boys down by the Missouri River. I want them to go down there and pick out a good, young, big, strong tree with a strong limb, branch, about 20 feet high, and we'll put you on that so that you'll lie there and watch your beloved Missouri River. Don't worry, it will be out of the flood area, but you'll see the Missouri River through eternity. And he said, no, I want to be buried up out here on the knoll like a white man. Dig it deep, lay me down there, and fill it with rocks about the size of a man's fist. And no animal will ever get to me. And fill the last two feet with good dirt and leave it flat so that grass will grow and horses will graze over me. Because if you put me down there, my soul will not rest in peace. This, this man made me believe in the spiritual power of the Indians. Because, now how did he know? You see, 1926, I heard that story. But he said it way back there in about 1868 or something like that. And here in 1940, Fort Randall Dam went in there. That raised the water level. So even though they put him in an, out of the flood area, that tree would have been covered. And there might have been a speck of bone of red leaf still there would have been disturbed. And today... That water, flooded water, comes and stops 200 yards from where Red Leaf's grave is. How do you like that? Let's take a moment now to size up this story from a few different angles. It's a narrative that's rich with ancestral places and practices. It's told against a backdrop of cultural change and conflict. There's the incursion of modern engineering that upends that ancient mode of burial in a tree. Earth and bone figure into this story. There's the poignance of things that are at once tragic and magical and transcendent. And the teller of the story concludes with a twist, with wonder and amazement. The voice belongs, of course, to Susie's brother. Their parents were of mixed blood, both the mother and the father. If all his stories and sermons are told like this, I think Vine Deloria Sr. probably had a rapt audience no matter where he spoke. And for all of this, the indigenous connections are not homogenous. They're conjoined with a Sully legacy, that legacy of European-style artistic production and expression. Returning now to an important strand in our broader story, we've touched on the notion of Sasue's shedding of blood that according to his dream, would require expiation. By family tradition, fulfillment has taken various shapes when members of the family have served the Yankton people over the generations. Sasway's son and grandson, Philip and Vine, would apply their Christian ministries to the task of righting past wrongs. And in subsequent generations, the sweat lodge path or that family calling or destiny, if we can call it any of that, well, it would put on more secular clothing. 
Rather than donning Christian garb as ordained ministers, younger offshoots of the family would perform service with the tools of scholarship and cultural analysis, and their efforts would be marked with renewed sympathy for their indigenous inheritance. Vine Deloria Jr. would follow his Aunt Ella's path into academics, becoming a prominent historian and a cultural scholar of Native American experience. Vine Jr. devoted a lot of thought to the confluence, the collision of Indian spiritual practices and Western thinking. And he often noted that many people looking in from the outside of a spiritual culture, many will yearn for access or try to borrow or tap into the essence or the beauty or the power of that culture. Some years ago, South Dakota Highway Department asked me if I would identify all the sacred sites to the Sioux in South Dakota. And I said, of course not. It's better to have them undisturbed and unused than to have all these people tromping, you know, busloads of tourists going through. And uh, they were quite put off because they wanted them as tourist attractions. There's a desperate need to appropriate from somebody, not necessarily Indians, but from somebody, some feeling, emotional feeling of authenticity. And the problem is that they all think of themselves as individualists. They don't have definable communities to return to. So they're just trapped, and I really feel sorry for them. The voice of Vine Deloria Jr. there, his son Philip, our guest today, well, for his part, he initially resisted the scholarly agenda with the family obligation of cultural mediation and remediation. He, he really just wanted to be a musician. I was a third grader playing the trombone in band, and by the time I was a seventh grader, I'd taken a few private lessons, and I moved to a new school, and there was a blind audition, and suddenly, like, I was the first chair trombone player. And for some reason, I caught that, you know, and I just stuck with it, and I practiced, and I worked hard, and I got better, and I found myself in wonderful musical educational contexts where this really came to take a lot of meaning to me. And it did seem like the thing that I wanted to do kind of more than anything else in the world. What I realized, of course, during my college years was I just wasn't talented enough to do it. You know, so I had I had, a rec- I had not only one reckoning, I had two reckonings, right? Because I also had a second parallel musical life, playing guitar and writing songs and playing bluegrass music and things like that. And at one point, I actually also tried to start a band. I was in a band or two and realized that I also didn't have enough talent to make a life in that direction as well. From the 1960s on, Philip's dad, Vine Deloria Jr., had been a force to be reckoned with in the arena of Native American activism and scholarship. That began with his election as executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. Under his leadership, that Congress expanded from 19 tribes to 156. Two of his most famous books, God is Red and Custer Died for Your Sins, are still in print and widely discussed 50 years on. A career of such influence can cast an imposing shadow. Just how reluctant was Philip to do similar work, to maybe sell out on his own identity? Well, I think everyone is escaping in some way. And my father tried to escape his father, and my grandfather tried to escape his father. I mean, my grandfather, in particularly, I think, evocative and poignant terms, my grandfather was a fabulous athlete. He was an honorable mention All-American in 1922. He played football. He lettered in four sports at what is now Bard College. He wanted to just be a coach and a player. That's what he really wanted. His father wanted him to be in the ministry. It was a long sort of and difficult kind of journey for him away from sports and back to, you know, being in the ministry. My dad tried to sort of have his own sort of escape velocity. He found himself pulled back in. I found myself kind of pulled back in. Part of sort of the story of Sasue is that the way that that vision, that story has been recounted was that the family would do these kind of cross-cultural mediating practices for seven generations, four generations, a long time. You know, so in some ways there's a I don't want to say a sense of destiny, but like it's not surprising, perhaps, that we get pulled back, right? Into uh, so why don't you want to say a sense of destiny? And that'd be a nice, tidy story right there. <laughs> Just say, I had to do this. Well, maybe I want to say it's more than a sense of destiny, actually. I mean, destiny sort of gives you a sense of fate, and it's a synchronicity, perhaps. But, I mean, if we took Sasue at his word, right, it would be actually a spiritual mission and legacy and obligation that was really laid upon the family. 
And for all of this, I just have to ask <laughs> the stock question about childhood. And as you were growing up, how did you identify? Did you say, I'm a Native American? You know, sometimes yes and sometimes less so, right, depending on the context, right? I mean, when you were with my family, when we went to the Black Hills to visit my grandparents, when we, these were mixed up gatherings, right, which were sort of white, assimilated kinds of things that had a really strong native current that ran through them in a sort of sense. Like when you're in the Black Hills, right, with my father and grandfather, you can't help but think about Lakota things, right? It just being in that place and feeling and experiencing that. And, and it's literally the place itself, which is a was found to be a profoundly spiritual place. And I don't mean that in a kind of mushy spiritual way. It's a scary place. I, I mean, I find it a scary place in the sense that we ought to be scared if we're sort of really having encounters with a spiritual world that is different and wholly other than the one in which we inhabit. It, it's not something that's tame. It's not something to be taken lightly. I've always experienced that landscape in that particular way. And, and for me, I guess, you know, that sort of sense of myself in that place with those people was a profoundly native kind of sensibility. But me sitting around playing the trombone with my foot at Wheat Ridge High School, where there are only two other native people, both of which I only discovered after I graduated. So I, did, I was not a person who was sort of, you know, um, kind of standing out and making those kinds of, you know, those kinds of claims at that time. You've just touched on something that's really, really important. And this idea of place and a connection to place. It's one thing to know of one's family's stories, to know where one comes from, and all of that can seem very abstract. You were lucky that you got to be taken by your family to these important ancestral places. There's such a concreteness there. Yeah, this year is the 50th anniversary of my dad's book, God is Red. It's a, it's a critique of Christianity, but it's also an assertion of native spirituality and its practices. And he says, look, you know, there are temporally based religions and practices, and there are spatially based ones. And native spirituality tends to be place based, which isn't to say it doesn't have temporality attached to it, but it is profoundly place based. And this is, of course, the struggles that we see in Native America today, right, is to hold on to and preserve sacred spaces and access to those places because they are fundamentally important. Going to a particular place to do a particular thing at a particular time just matters so, so deeply. And I, I suspect that listeners will understand things that I've come to understand, like, you can walk into a place, and, and I'm talking not just about a city or something like this, but like a you know uninhabited kind of area. You can be in a place and feel certain things, right, about it. If you are sensitive to the place you're in, you can feel like this is a good place. But you can also feel like, and I've had this experience, this is a bad place. This is not a place. It's a, a sitcha, right, a bad place. It's a place I don't want to be, and I'm not, I don't belong here. And I actually need to turn around and leave. So if we are actually sensitized to those kinds of things, and take them seriously, we're going to be engaged in a whole different kind of way of living and engaging with the places that we occupy. I mean, the other thing about it is to maintain a freshness about life, to see things for the first time as if you're seeing them new, the, that kind of open-eyed sort of sense that you get when you walk into a new place and all your senses are tingling and you're paying attention right to where you are. If you want to live that life all the time, which I think should be our aspiration, place and place-focused ways of thinking and being. It's how we live, I think, fundamentally. So is this idea of place being so important, is this something your father told you about, your grandfather, uh, any of the females in your family? Uh, was this imparted to you by them? I probably spent more time in, in conversation with my grandfather than my father. But my father wrote over 30 books and he wrote down what he was thinking a lot. And I've tried to sort of, especially as these books start coming up on their 50th anniversaries. So for both Custer Died for Your Sins and God is Red, we've had 50th anniversary celebrations. I've gone back and reread these books very closely. I'm really fortunate that I actually have my father's voice in my head through the text that he produced. And so some part of what I'm thinking about is actually... You could call it oral history, except it's actually written history that he's passing on, not just to me, but to other, to other people. The last good place that you went to, where you felt present and connected, where was that? Mm. Well, I have my places. And I will say the place that I have felt really kind of wondrous sort of sense of the world is outside of Steamboat Springs, Colorado, in the Mount Zirkel Wilderness area. 
and there's a particular trail there. And it's one of the very first places I went backpacking as a kid. I get up to this lake and then I, I leave the lake and the trail and all of those things. And I cross over a ridge and I come down into a valley and then I descend down into another valley. And there's a, the small beginnings of a stream that are coming off of a snow field. And, and I've been to that place more than once, several, several times. You know, for me, that's a place that like just has this sort of sense of animation, but also peacefulness you know, reassurance, but also excitement and, and vitality and, and living. And, you know, if I take that as kind of my prototypical place, right, I can carry the affect of that place in, into many, many other kinds of locations. So there are those moments in which the power of the place actually structures the experience that you have. Does it sit well with you to think that in that practice of connecting to place and good places, you are doing what maybe Sasway might have wanted to do, that your grandfather might have wanted to do, that uh, maybe Ella or Susie, Mary Sully, would have wanted to do. Well, I would love to think that, yes. I mean, who wouldn't want to think that, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to sort of take that family history and look back over your shoulder at all those ancestors and think that you were part of that chain? I mean, of course I want to think that, and of course I, I do think that. I am the person that I am because of the way that society has made me, but I also think because of the ways in which our family and our ancestors do, in fact, inhabit us. I mean, this is, a, I think, a profoundly indigenous way of thinking that the family really does matter, right? The ancestors do matter. I've spent a, a bit of time lately thinking about some of the sort of the ways in which we pushed back the dates of human inhabitants back to, you say, 23,000 years or so. When I look at the landscape now, one used to think, oh, that's dirt. And then we started thinking, no, that's soil and it's actually alive. And now I think that's not just soil, right? That's human soil. That's the dust of people over 23,000 years that are here and they're present in this land. They're part of this thing. This is, I think, why Native people feel such an obligation to their lands. It's not just that like, oh, there's a few generations of ancestors buried there. It's that there are tens of thousands of years of ancestors who've literally become the stuff of the land. They've become the minerals, the, the grains of soil that produce the plants that occupy that space. And this has been a point of meditation for me and it feels incredibly profound. Multiple places and people with all their various dreams and visions and values, their traditions. All of this goes into the person who has been our guest in this episode. He's not just a history professor at Harvard, not just a trombonist either. I do want to mention, though, he is author most recently of Becoming Mary Sully Toward an American Indian Abstract. And his prominence as a historian began with his groundbreaking book, Playing Indian, published in 1998. It's been a delight to visit with Philip J. Deloria for Constant Wonder. Eric Schultzka produced this episode with Colson Darrington. Special thanks also to the Sacred Land Film Project and Canyon Records for audio clips you heard today. Also, thanks to the Densmore Repatriation Project and Calvin Standing Bear for music provided in this episode. I'm Marcus Smith. Thanks for listening to Constant Wonder, a production of BYU Radio.